Hi, I'm George Lukacs. And I'm Lisa Allen. Thank you for joining us on Community Conversation. Every year, about 250,000 new cases of invasive breast cancer will be diagnosed in women. And every year, about 17,000 Americans become infected with hepatitis C. And about 175,000 men in the United States are diagnosed with prostate cancer. However, according to the CDC, over 300,000 people are diagnosed every year with Lyme disease. Is this growing epidemic getting the attention it deserves? Are the numbers as serious as we might think? Today, we welcome two guests from the Global Lyme Alliance who think there are and the public should be paying more attention locally and globally. First, we introduce you to Scott Santarella. Scott assumed his position of Chief Exe Executive Officer of Global Lyme Alliance in May 2016. And as CEO, he heads up the leading private nonprofit dedicated to Lyme and tick-borne research and education. He directs overall strategy, operations, and fundraising to increase awareness and hasten advances in diagnostic and treatments with the ultimate goal of finding a cure for Lyme and tick-borne diseases. Our second guest is Myla Shu, PhD. She joined Global Lyme Alliance in 2015 as its in-house science officer and is now Director of Research and Science. She manages GLA's research grant program, working with the Scientific Advisory Board, and creating viable partnerships to help advance the development and the reliable diagnostic tests that effective treatments and ultimately a cure for Lyme. Thank you for joining us, both of you. Happy to be here. Yeah. Thanks for having us. This is exciting to have you here. We actually, George and I did a segment prior to this. Um, we interviewed a Lyme sufferer, a mother who was taking care of her daughter who was very sick and an acupuncturist. Um, and we thought that it would be great to welcome you to the show so that you could talk about the, the current situation and research looking towards the future. So yeah. tell us a little bit about Global Lyme Alliance and what you do there. We mm -hmm. gave a description, but maybe a little bit something more sure. in depth. We're, um, a global organization uh, based uh, in Connecticut, but uh, have an impact around the world, not only in the research that we try to fund, um, but also raising awareness and educating patients and the general public about the effects and the uh, epidemic that is Lyme disease. Uh, our primary focus is actually funding research. About 80% of the dollars that we raise go back out the door to fund research-related projects. Uh, and our goal is actually to try to eradicate the disease, hopefully over the next 10 years or so, understanding it's gonna take some time to figure out the challenges associated with, with this disease and coming up with some new treatment options for patients. Um, Lyme disease is found uh, in all 50 states or have been diagnosed by patients in all 50 states. It's found in 49% of all counties around the US, including in Hawaii and Alaska. So uh, no one really is immune from the disease. Uh, Lyme disease is real, the threat is real, and we're here to try to find eventually a cure for all those that are suffering from the disease. Mm -hmm. So research, that seems to be the, the answer, and this is something that I know that you're, that you're doing right now. Importance of research and really understanding what Lyme disease is about. Yes, that's right. Um, the National Institutes of Health, the NIH, which is the arm of the government that funds research, has been very low in funding Lyme disease uh, over the past few years, and the funding has stayed flat. So as an example, I'll, I'll um, cite that uh, Lyme disease received $24 million in funding for research last year from the NIH. Um, and as you mentioned, 330,000 people get diagnosed with it every year. Now in contrast, West Nile virus, which is spread by mosquito bites, um, received something like $48 million um, in research dollars, and that affects about 2,000 people every year. So there is some disproportion. We would like to see there be more research by the government, but in the absence of that, this is where um, private nonprofits such as ours uh, fill in those gaps. Well, and I find this so interesting. I mean, every one of us has a backyard. Every one of us can go to a park. Every one of us can be exposed. Why is there not more urgency around funding this research? Why is there resistance to addressing Lyme in this country? Uh, I think there's a perception uh, among much of the mainstream medical community that Lyme disease is a very easily cured illness. And for most people, uh, it is true that a short course, maybe two or three weeks of, of antibiotics may be enough 
to make them feel better. But it is also true that about 10 to 20 percent of people who get Lyme disease go on to suffer persisting symptoms beyond six months, even after they've received antibiotics. And that's even um, uh, probably a conservative number because there are a number of people who probably aren't even properly diagnosed at the outset, so they never receive treatment. And for them, delays in treatment and diagnosis mean that they will have an increased probability of persisting symptoms that are long term. These can go on for months, for years even, in, in many people, and the symptoms can be so severe that they derail normal life. It's interesting, Lisa, you mentioned that the, the attention is, just isn't there, and it's, as you said, doctor, an epidemic. So how do we change the consciousness of the doctors, if you will, or even to make Lyme more aware with people? Because you can't, as you said, you can't hide from the disease. Well, you I can't hide from these ticks. We've seen a lot in the media this year that it's going to be one of the worst tick seasons ever, and a lot of that has to do with weather and, and the way that the, the winter uh, uh, was warm here, certainly in the Northeast, but around the country. And we're seeing that even today with the heat uh, over the summer. Um, I also think that there's this sort of uh, ideal from people that, you know, I'm, I'm immune to it. And I said it in the beginning that you're not immune, right? You have to really be careful and really be aware. Um, a lot of celebrities have come forward now that have been diagnosed with the disease, and uh, this country is driven by entertainment and celebrity in a lot of ways, so I think that's helping to raise the, the consciousness of the country around this disease, and really worldwide around the disease, and that's a really good thing. I think the role that we play as an organization is to try to really put the facts behind uh, some of the myths that are out there around Lyme disease, uh, fund research that's credible and scientific and evidence-based, so that we have uh, um, a value and, and uh, an accountability to the work that we're actually funding and really drive progress through um, the science and the research that's out there. Um, and while some non-traditional methods are being used to sort of deal with some of the symptoms of Lyme disease, um, we're not going to really make any progress until we can really understand the, the, the science behind the disease and come up with new treatment pathways for patients that are credible and, and uh, accepted by the medical community. And that's a big challenge that we have, but one that we're willing to face and we're taking head on. And I can give you a concrete example of that, actually. We fund a researcher at Columbia University Medical School called Dr. Armin Aladini, who is an immunologist. And what he has shown is that if you compare blood samples from people who have had Lyme disease who are cured compared to people who have had Lyme disease who are still sick years later, you can identify clear biological differences in their blood that indicate that there is a persistent inflammatory state going on in those people who are still sick compared to those who, are, who have been cured. Yeah. Okay, so we need evidence like this that is pretty unassailable that shows first there is a biological difference in these people who are still sick, that these symptoms are not all in their head, they're not invented, they're not psychosomatic, they actually exist, and then we have to start asking the questions, why? Why are they still sick? Why do these people get cured and these people are still sick? And then what do we do about it? And to add to that, there's a lot of talk in the medical community, health community about personalized medicine, precision medicine. In a disease like Lyme disease, it affects individuals individually. So we really need to look at how we actually address the disease sort of on a one-to-one -one basis versus trying to put people in the categories of the disease and this is how we're going to treat them. And that adds to the complication of trying to actually give people the right type of treatment pathway. Is it complicated too because I, everybody says it's the great mimicker, right? So is that part of the trickiness around diagnosing people because it opens up the opportunity for disease that you might be genetically prone to, that it kind of opens up the opportunity for that those particular illnesses to take over? Is that, or is it the co-infections? Well, well, there's a lot to unpack in what you just said, but <laughs> maybe starting from the beginning of yeah. the question, um, it's been called the great imitator because people with, with persisting Lyme symptoms can have a whole constellation of different symptoms that, that will affect different organs. And so that's why it's often referred to as post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's also one of the problems because there is no single case definition that is accepted that you know with no identifiable quantifiable biomarkers that you know we can do a blood test and show that you have elevated this and diminished this and that is exactly what we expect to see in every single chronic Lyme patient 
No, there isn't. We aren't at that point in our knowledge yet. And so that is one reason why the mainstream medical community does not accept that there is such a thing as persisting Lyme disease. Once we have this single case definition or perhaps a diagnostic test, then it will become much easier. But all of that requires a lot of research to get there. Mm. Wow. Yeah. So uh, there is a cure that c people can be cured, I guess is what I'm hearing, uh, a, a certain percentage. But we were talking earlier about what you can define as Lyme literate physicians. What, what are Lyme literate physicians that people would probably want to go to? How's, how's that defined? I, I think we define it as someone who actually has taken uh, the initiative to understand the disease as best they can within the framework of their knowledge and their, their background. Um, and they're trying to utilize the tools that are available to them to treat patients in an effective way to, in a lot of ways, alleviate some of the symptoms that they're having from the Lyme disease to Mela's point. Um, it's oftentimes the treatments that are out there um, are alleviating the pain and the suffering that they're having uh, because of the effects of Lyme disease and not necessarily addressing the bacteria itself inside the, the human body. I don't know if you want to add to that. Right, that's true. That is one of the, the sort of mysteries also in understanding this disease because when people are still sick, even after they've been treated, so let's say they've continued to have symptoms a year after they received antibiotics. Now, is it that the, they have ongoing continued bacterial replication in their body that we just cannot find? Because one of the, the ideas is that is that the bacterium that causes Lyme disease, it's called Borrelia burgdorferi, it's only in the blood for about three to four weeks at the very beginning, and then it leaves the blood and goes into the deeper tissues, into connective tissues perhaps, into the joints, uh, into places that are not easily sampled. And it's very difficult to find continued bacterial replication. Now maybe it's because our techniques for finding it are not sensitive enough. But maybe it's also true that the bacteria is no longer there and that now what the person has is some kind of autoimmune disease where their own immune system is making them sick. So again, we don't know uh, which is the answer. We need more research to figure that out. Which actually leads me to the vaccination. Now, there was a vaccination some time ago. It, w it made people ill, and so they pulled it off the market. And now they're talking about bringing out another vaccination. Um, not that we're out encouraging people to do it or not to do it. What are the pros and cons of taking a vaccination for Lyme? No, I'll let me lay okay. <laughs> It's a little bit above my pay grade. Okay, well, um, obviously, you know, we take, we use vaccines to prevent getting sick, okay? And so if we have a vaccine for Lyme disease, first of all, we want it to be as effective as possible. I believe the, the vaccine that was pulled from the market was 70% um, effective. Mm -hmm. So we would like that number to be as high as possible because if someone receives a vaccine, right, the first thing that's gonna happen to them is they're going to say, well, I'm protected. I don't need to do tick checks anymore, right? Mm -hmm. um, but if you have a 70% effective vaccine and you don't do tick checks anymore, you still have a possibility of getting Lyme disease, right? Especially if you relax your, your vigilance and you're, you're not checking and you're not checking your children and that sort of thing. Um, so that's a limitation. Uh, we need a, a vaccine that works. The other thing is that, yes, um, there, there were people who believed that they were harmed by the last vaccine. And so to be able to test the vaccine, you have to test in a Lyme endemic area where you expect to have a certain high number of cases of Lyme every year so that in your test population, that number will go down. You have to be able to see the numbers of expected Lyme go down in the people who have received your vaccine. And so it will have to be tested possibly in an area like the Northeast of the United States. And there is still a lot of public resistance to the idea of, of having a, a Lyme vaccine. Mm. Yeah, I think there will be some challenges with the vaccine. I'm, I'm not against it. I think okay. it could add some value. Mm -hmm. um, I think a big focus for us is the, the patient population that is in that persister chronic area of the disease that have been suffering for a long time or were diagnosed, were treated and are still suffering. And that's, you know, probably close to a million people when you look at it, five years of 300,000 people being diagnosed a year and the percentage that actually have this continual uh, impact of the disease in their body. We're trying to really try to focus on how do we help those individuals. Not that we wouldn't want a vaccine to help those that haven't been diagnosed yet, but I think, um, I think that's a, a long way away from actually being publicly accepted, in my mind, personal view. Right. right. So 
Interesting. Moving on a little bit to the health insurance aspect of this. So chronic Lyme disease and health insurance is not something that is compatible, it seems like, correct? Because the symptoms are mysterious, I suppose, to, to many insurers because there's no way of knowing if that chronic Lyme continues as actual Lyme. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that gets back to a, a good diagnostic test, right? If we had a better diagnostic tool that we could prove all the time that someone's Lyme positive, right? Um, I think healthcare companies would then say, okay, we know that we can determine that someone is sick, and so then we can cover that test and maybe the treatment based on whatever the protocol might be or the, uh, the traditional um, treatment pathway should be based on health insurance companies want to make sure that the disease exists. And that's, I think, uh, one of the challenges we have and one of the areas of focus for the organization from a research perspective is how do we come up with a more definitive diagnostic tool um, so that we can better identify patients that are sick at the acute stage but also patients that might be sick through the persister or the chronic stage. That's really important, I think, that's persistent stage that you're talking about because, you know, five months after you take your, your antibiotics, assuming they might not work, you have your knees are blowing up, uh, you have memory loss, uh, you're depressed. These are all symptoms that can occur and they can be very easily separated from Lyme disease. That's right, and that seems to be the tendency of the way the mainstream medical community operates in the absence of a case definition for chronic or persistent Lyme disease, right? So they look at these as possibly you just have depression. Well, right. I don't want to say just, but you solely have depression or you solely have you know, arthritis in your knee, um, and it's not necessarily connected with the Lyme that you had five months ago. All right. right. How do you find a Lyme literate doctor? So you actually can go to our website, uh, info at uh, medical, uh, LymeMedical.org. Um, and we have an individual who spends uh, a full-time uh, sort of position identifying Lyme literate doctors within all parts of the country. So we have a list of doctors that we can recommend to patients who are looking for uh, someone that has some Lyme disease experience and we feel is at least appropriate to approach to get your care and maybe get better, better treatment options for yourself. Yeah. There's a threat targeting America, Lyme disease. Spread by tiny ticks, this dangerous disease can cause life-changing health problems and is now more widespread than West Nile tuberculosis and HIV AIDS combined. So it's time for us to target Lyme disease. That means checking for ticks when you've been outside and seeing a doctor if you experience the warning signs which can include joint pain and flu-like symptoms. Learn how you can target Lyme disease at targetlyme.org. You know, one of the things that, you know, we're trying to do, I think, from just from having you here, is raising the awareness of Lyme disease. And uh, I'm not sure how you do that, because, you know, with, uh, with West Nile and with Azika, you had the pregnant woman issue, and that was a fear, that people were terrified of that. You know women wouldn't take vacations in Florida. They'd stop going to, to certain parts of the country. This is a disease that is in all 50 states, and I don't think people really understand that. How do we make people more aware? I mean, I know Great with Glo Global Lyme Alliance, sure. that's important, globallymealliance.org yeah. is important to go to, but how do we really raise that consciousness and awareness? That's so important. A lot of it is being done through social media, as you can imagine, right? That's sort of the, the platform that's taken over all of our lives. Um, so that's one a area of focus that we have as an organization. Um, we do conduct fundraising events and awareness events around the country, um, one here in New York City, uh, one in Connecticut. We're doing one in Chicago in August. We're planning one for Los Angeles, one in Miami wow. in the new year. So um, some of it's ground groundswell, grassroots uh, movement around it. Um, other is utilizing the celebrities out there and, and piggybacking off of their stories with stories of everyday people. Um, what we like to say is if you don't know somebody with Lyme disease or you don't have Lyme disease, you're going to know somebody at some point because right. every time I turn around and tell people where I work, they're like, oh, I have Lyme disease or my sister had it or I know my cousin had it. So um, it's, it's uh, a disease that a lot of people don't talk about um, and that's one of the things we're trying to you know, raise the, the public consciousness around the disease through those types of discussions. and. Um, doing shows like this, and uh, mela has been out on the speaking circuit in a variety of different ways, talking about Lyme disease sort of 101, but also the research that we're doing. Um, it's gonna take a community of people and um, um, interested and, and proponents of this disease like yourselves 
that will help us get the word out there. And uh, we'll, we'll do it. We're, we're, we're making progress. We really are. Right. Um, I do think, though, that one, one problem for trying to disseminate information and awareness about Lyme disease is that so many people who have Lyme disease look well. Right, Great so yeah. so so they're not necessarily in bed all day every day for three months. Some right. of them are, but there are others who appear to be very functional. You know, we just don't realize that as soon as they go home, they collapse, um, or are prone to very sensitive to uh, things like like uh, environmental mold or. Mm -hmm. Uh, easily catch colds or that kind of thing. So we, we, I think, sometimes underestimate how much Lyme there is just because a lot of Lyme, persisting Lyme, chronic Lyme patients uh, appear to be on the surface very well. Mm. Now, I know you're evidence-based, and I'm just going to throw out a little bit something that might be somewhat controversial. Global warming and Lyme disease, is there a correlation or do you think there'll be a correlation? Oh, I don't think that's controversial at all. Okay. Uh, there's a whole body of research studying whether or not climate change is responsible for uh, the expansion of the range of the ticks that cause Lyme and other tick-borne illnesses. And right now, um, among the people who study that, there is some debate whether or not it's climate change, warming temperatures, ticks love humidity, so as climates become more humid and hotter, uh, ticks can survive better. Um, ticks are expanding into Canada, and Lyme disease is becoming an issue in, in Canada that never saw it before. Um, and it's also expanding in further north and west within the United States uh, into the Ohio Valley. It's, Valley, it's becoming um, much more prevalent than it used to be. But there is a discussion whether it's climate change or land management that is also uh, a driver of, of ticks uh, tick growth and tick expansion. So land management refers to um, the way that we treat our farmland and the borders between woods and suburban areas. So um, hundreds of years ago when when Europeans first colonized the northeast of the United States and wanted to build farms, they cut down a lot of forested areas. So there was a very clear demarcation between farmland and forest. And plus, I also think that the, the winters were harsher, and so the ticks uh, were not as active as they are now. Um, now, we have people living in woodsy areas, suburban areas that are bordered and surrounded by and inf infiltrated by a lot of really forested areas. And so that allows deer, that allows uh, mice and small mammals to live very close to humans and, and their activities. Of course, we know that, that uh, these are all hosts for ticks. So it's a sort of long answer, but yes, oh. global warming and land management are both probably paying, playing a large role in the expanding Lyme epidemic. Um, as we wind down our time, I would really like to know, how do we protect ourselves? That's a great question. Um, there's a variety of ways, um, certainly uh, wearing the proper clothing. Mm -hmm. um, there's uh, is it promethean sprays right? that you can put on your clothes and uh, protect yourselves that way. Um, to me, I think the biggest protection is being aware, right? right? Is just be Lyme aware. Look for ticks if you're spending a lot of time outside. Uh, check your children, certainly. Check your pets. Um, I think making sure that you're understanding that you may be in an environment where you could be exposed uh, is one way to, 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 to really probably do the best prevention. Um, protecting your hat and, and the back of your neck. Uh, mm -hmm. Birds carry ticks, so we know they can drop from trees and things. I mean, there's really, like I said, there, no one's immune to the exposure of Lyme disease. You can do a lot of things to protect yourself, uh, and those are some of them. And there's a lot more uh, on our website if yeah. people are interested in learning more detail around that. You know, it's, it's like protecting yourself from the sun. You have to protect yourself Correct. from ticks and, and Lyme disease. One final question, global. You know, we talk about the United States. If, if I take a trip to Rome or to... Tokyo, am I going to have to ever worry about Lyme disease, or is this concentrated much more in North America? No, you should absolutely be conscious. Everywhere you go in the world, there are ticks. Even in Antarctica, there have been ticks recorded, uh, tick-borne um, parasites dropping off uh, penguins in, in an Antarctica. Um, Europe, they have two species of the bacterium that causes Lyme that are more associated with neurological symptoms than, they, than wow. the ones here. So um, yes, absolutely you have to be conscious, especially if you go walking in the mountains in, in the Alps or something like that. Even though it's quite cool there, you, you know, anytime you're, you're in nature, even urban parks in London. So they're, that, this they're, should be part of daily regimen. 
really, I guess. Yeah. It, it's it almost, has to be. Yeah. It's got to be in our in our face makeup and our sunscreen. <laughs> this, is, I mean, this is great. It's a I step think, in the right direction. No, but yeah. it, 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 this is to me really raised uh, the awareness and uh, of Lyme, and and you and I have both have experience with that. Yet, I don't know enough about it, but this has really been, you know, for me, very, very rewarding just talking to you too. It really has right. been. Oh, thank nice. you for having us. Thank you. Thank you for the thank platform. Thank you for your time. Well, yep. Keep up the good fight. Oh, thank, thank you, you so much. Wonderful. Thank you. A very special thanks to our guests for sharing their expertise and experiences today. And thank you, our viewers, for watching Community Conversation. If anything you heard today feels like it might relate to you, please go to Global Lyme Alliance's website at www.gla.org. And for more programming like this at Hometown TV, please visit us at www.hometowntv.org. Subscribe to our YouTube channel at Hometown Television. And don't forget to like us on Facebook and subscribe to our Instagram at Hometown TV. Thank you again for joining us.